welcome to this session on day one of the Better Learning Leadership Conference. It's lovely to see you here and to have talked to so many of you just now in the networking session. I hope those of you who attended Claire Denbrough's talk on the principles of language learning uh, really enjoyed that and found it useful. And apologies to anyone who tuned in to our very first session. Unfortunately, our speaker had internet connection problems and couldn't, couldn't tune in. Um, however, we are recording that session, so you should be able to watch it later. Anyway, my name is Karen Mumba. I'm professional learning and development consultant at Cambridge University Press. And it's my pleasure today to be the host for this session. Kate is very much with us. Um, but before I introduce Kate, uh, I just have a couple of uh, bits of information to share with you. Firstly, PowerPoint slides will not be shared, uh, but we are recording this session and you'll be able to view it later this week on our YouTube channel. Do bear in mind though, that interactive sessions such as this one can't be recorded in full as we can't um, record breakout rooms. And secondly, if you RSVP to the uh, invite for this event, you'll be sent an email after the event containing a certificate of attendance plus links to session recordings. Um, so it'd be great, you can put your cameras on so we can see you, which would be great, um, but do keep your microphones off, um, unless asked to do so by Kate, and you can put any comments in the chat box or any questions in the chat box. So, on to the session. I'm delighted to welcome Kate Brereton, who is a chartered clinical psychologist. Kate studied at both Cambridge University and the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in London, and she currently has her own clinical practice. She works with clients of all ages, including children with complex needs in both mainstream and special schools. Kate uses compassion-based compassion-focused therapy and mindfulness in much of her work. And Kate will be talking to us today about the well-being of educational leaders and the importance of self-compassion. So, over to you, Kate. Hello, everybody. Um, hi, thank you very much for that introduction, Karen. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now and get my slides up for you. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see those. Can you give me a thumbs up if you've got your camera on just to tell me whether you can see them? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today uh, running this workshop on what I think is a really important topic, the well-being of educational leaders. Um, and it's interesting because I don't see a lot written about this. So I see a lot written about the well-being of students and a lot about the well-being of teachers, um, but not much specifically for leaders. And actually, I think this is key because as leaders, you hold the organisation in your hands, literally. Um, and when things get tough, when there are challenges, everybody in your school, in your college, in your university, they look to you. You know, the buck stops with you, doesn't it? Um, and so my message to every educational leader I speak to and work with is prioritise your own well-being. Um, and that's not being selfish or self-centered, that's being really wise. Prioritize your own well-being first. Now, I'm gonna try and make this workshop as interactive as possible. I'm sure you're like me throughout the pandemic, we've done a lot of online working. Um, so I'm gonna try and make this as kind of interactive and meaningful as possible, um, but there's not gonna be a lot of time to answer individual questions. So I've got my email address up there. So if you have any questions you'd like to send to me after the end of the presentation, please do. I always love to hear from educators. So it's kate at compassionatecambridge.co.uk. Um, and I say, please do send me an email. I'm really, really happy to um, correspond with you. So let me move my onto my first slide. Okay, so workshop content. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about 
what makes a compassionate mind? And as Karen said, I do compassion focused therapy and compassion is really the cornerstone of all of my work, both what I do with individual clients and families in my clinic, but also when it comes to my presentations, my authoring and education. I believe that the world would be a more supportive and a nicer place to live if there could just be a little bit more compassion everywhere. And I think that's particularly important in our educational institutions because you guys, you are shaping minds. So can I put out a plea there? Please shape them with compassion in mind. But actually to be able to do that, you have to create and cultivate your own compassionate mind. And that's what we're going to start today. It really does have to be inside out. OK, it's no good being compassionate with everybody yes, else again. if you're not compassionate with yourself. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to think about what makes up a compassionate mind. We're going to talk about how life experiences shape and mould us, often in ways that we um, don't control and can't predict. We're going to talk about the tricky brain and how we have a brain that is not designed for 21st century living. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Then I'm going to talk to you about the emotional systems of the mind so that you have a bit of an understanding about the neuroscience, what's going on up here when we're experiencing our emotions. There's going to be a breakout room um, exercise halfway through where I'm going to dare you to be vulnerable. And that's a phrase that I've borrowed from Brené Brown, who's an American author who, who writes a lot about daring to be vulnerable and about actually sometimes we have to be open to talking about our emotions and talking about the tough times because that's what allows us to develop and grow. So in your breakout rooms, I'm going to be you know, I'm going to challenge you to dare to be vulnerable and have a conversation about the emotional work of leading with the other people in your room, the other leaders in your room. And then finally, I'm going to end on an exercise which, when I first did this exercise, I found it transformational. And it's an exercise that can help you accept and welcome your emotions. And that might, might sound kind of strange, but you, you'll understand it by the time we've got to the end of the workshop. And then hopefully when we do that exercise, you'll really understand that this can be liberating. But we're going to start with a poll. OK, so the first of our interactive activities. So I want you to think over the past seven days, what's your own emotional well-being been like? This is a chance for you to pause and reflect. OK, um, and we've got from zero to 10, I've split it into three. So low is from zero to three, medium from four to seven, and high is eight to 10. So low is like, it's been really stressful, I've been really anxious, or I've been really kind of sad and hopeless. Medium is just kind of, well, I've been kind of okay, it's been all right. High is, I've been thriving this week, it's been an amazing week. So if you could do the poll now, Catherine, I think she's going to do that. Brilliant, fantastic. So let's see how everybody is feeling today. Wow, look at that. Fantastic. So it looks like kind of everybody's pretty much okay. We've got a few people who've had a, a stressful time. It's been difficult. And then also a few people that have really been thriving. Okay, excellent. Um, do you know something? This is really interesting, actually, that there has been um, a study done on this when we ask people to kind of rate their well-being and, and rate how happy they are, um, that this is typically what we find. And actually, our kind of average well-being is around about six or seven. Um, so it's interesting that the room is feeling like that today. OK, so I'm going to end the polling and move on to the next. Um, oh, hang on a minute. There we go. I get to share the results. There we go, our final results. So 80% of people are in that middle category. Okay, let's take that off. Right, so moving on. Let's have a think about a compassionate mind. And these are the beliefs 
that help us to develop self-compassion. So the first thing is understanding and accepting that we are shaped by life's experiences. Okay, and a lot of those experiences we have no control over. And I've got another slide on that coming up, so I'm not going to go into detail, but just to think about that, to think about how much, particularly our early experiences, shape us, and yet we don't choose them. I've already mentioned that our brains are not designed for 21st century living, and actually our brains are quite difficult to manage. And again, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute that we experience really powerful emotions and emotions are powerful. They're not just like, you know, vague feelings. They have the power to hijack our mind and our body. So emotions are powerful and that's just how it is to be human. We are human and that means we make mistakes like quite a lot of the time and that's okay. So a compassionate mind understands that we can make mistakes. That's absolutely fine. That's just part of being human. And the whole journey of life is learning from those mistakes. That's where we get our wisdom. Um, and then lastly, but I think really importantly, it's not our fault the way that we're feeling. You can't help the way you feel. Actually, this is some, something else that people kind of struggle with, I think. Feelings are automatic, they just arise, and we don't have any control in the moment over how we feel. Um, so it's not our fault, but it is our responsibility to look after ourselves. And again, it's really important. So yes, we are supported hopefully by the people around us and by the organizations around us. Um, and I hope that we're going to do a bit of that today. I hope that CUP and my talk will support you in a way. But it's also our responsibility to look after ourselves. And this is interesting. I do quite a lot of relationship therapy. And I will always say to couples, actually, don't look to the other person to make you happy. Make yourself happy. And I would say to anybody, don't look to everybody else to look after your well-being. Learn to support your own well-being. It's our responsibility, actually. Okay, so shaped by life. Um, I'd really like you to get involved with this in the chat box if you're feeling brave enough. Just remember when you're sharing in the chat box not to put anything... Um, too personal in there because you won't know the other people taking part in this in this workshop so keep it kind of quite top line quite top level um, but it would be brilliant is if as I'm talking you can think about what have influenced your life what have been the really big influences um, and then just put briefly in the chat box what those have been um, and I'll have a look when I finish the slide. So I've split the influences um, in life into two brackets there, our early experiences and our later experiences. Early experiences, the research shows over and over again how much the experiences we have during childhood shape and mould us into the adults we become. So the type of parenting we receive, the kind of family we grow up in. Do we grow up with, our, with siblings or are we only children? Are our parents um, responsive to our needs or are they a little bit inconsistent to our needs? The culture we're born into leaves us with a huge set of beliefs about the way we should be in the world. So your idea about what a leader is is heavily shaped by the culture that you were born into. The kind of schooling, you know, we, we receive, even down to the gender that we are assigned when we're born, that we're born into, okay? All of these hugely shape and mould us. And yet what I want to draw your attention to is that we didn't choose any of those. I mean, firstly, we didn't choose to be born, <laughs> right? Nobody chooses to be born. Um, but we didn't choose the family we were born into. We didn't choose our parents, didn't choose culture. Most people didn't choose the school we went to and we didn't choose the gender that we were born into, that we were assigned. And yet they all hugely 
shape us. And that's really important to hold on to when we're building and developing our self-compassion. We've also got later experiences too that can shape us. So different kinds of relationships shape us, Friends, friendships, you know, intimate relationships, partnerships, all of those shape and mold us. The career that we go into, um, society, world events, obviously, you know, how has COVID shaped and influenced you? Um, and then personal events too. So sometimes we have really difficult life um, events that happen to us. We might get divorced, we might lose somebody very close to us, we might get ill, all of those hugely shape us. So I'm just gonna have a quick look and see whether I can see the chat box now. It's gone, where has it disappeared to? Hmm. I can't see it. Mind. Let me just, I'm just going to escape from my screen. Ah, there we go, my chat's come back. Okay, I will share my screen in a minute. I just want to have a look what people have put into. Brilliant, yeah, so a lot about parenting, loss, indeed, that can shape us hugely. Family, childhood, schooling, brilliant. Fantastic, absolutely parenting. There's a lot about, I think everybody recognizes that the way we're parented can shape us dramatically. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing those. Now I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay. Okay, so we are shaped by life. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the tricky brain. We call it the tricky brain in compassion focused therapy. Um, nobody sat down um, and produced a blueprint of the perfect brain for the 21st century. Nobody designed our brains. They have evolved over hundreds and thousands of years. And they've actually evolved in a kind of layered structure. And I hope that you can see there, we've kind of, I've picked out the three main layers of the brain that I talk about when I'm working with people. At the bottom, we have our kind of brainstem and our instinctual responses. And actually they're very similar to the reptilian brain. So they go back in evolutionary terms a long, long time. Then we have the limbic brain, and this is present in mammals. And this is where our emotions mostly sit. So we have a little structure that the arrow is pointing there called the amygdala. And that's where we feel. That's the part of the brain responsible for our emotions. Um, and the limbic brain evolved in mammals to help mammals care for one another, to have relationships so that they could live in social groups and also they could have offspring that they cared and nurtured and that developed over time. Obviously the difference between um, reptiles and mammals is that reptiles have babies that are kind of autonomous and they leave. They, there's no parenting involved. Whereas mammals, undergo you know this parenting we were talking about that shapes us um, and the limbic brain helps us to do that but what really distinguishes humans from all the other species on the planet is this big wiggly bit at the top here the neocortex literally the new cortex um, and in humans, this is huge, far bigger than in any other species. And it's the part of the brain that allows us to do all the amazing stuff that we do as humans. This is where our planning comes from, our problem solving, um, our memory, our language, our imagination, our creativity, all comes from this neo cortex and it has allowed us to do amazing things it's allowed us to invent technology which means that I can sit here today and talk to people around the world on my computer screen I mean like that's like amazing um, it's sent us to the moon it's done all sorts of amazing things but in regard to our well-being there is a downside and the downside is that we are the only species that can think ourselves into an emotion. So using our neocortex where we have thought, that can trigger the amygdala again and again and again. And so we can feel frightened about something that's not even happening yet. Or we can worry about something we've done 
you know, yesterday or five years ago or something that happened to us in childhood. No other species, as far as we know, can do that. And so we believe this is why humans can get so stressed. We're not just responding to the immediate world, we're responding to our internal thoughts. And I've displayed that on the next slide. Um, so this is a picture of a woman. Um, she's out for a walk with her dog after a bit of a stressful day at work. Okay, so this is an educational leader. Um, and look at the difference between the two species. So the woman has had a really bad meeting. Okay, she had a meeting with some of her staff, it did not go well. And she is ruminating about that. She's thinking about that. And she's actually thinking in her head, oh dear, people don't like me. My staff don't like me. And then she's thinking her worst fear, I'm a useless leader. I'm a, I must be a rubbish leader. That meeting went so badly. I failed to get my point across. I really upset everybody. I'm so useless at this. And so you can imagine with all of those thoughts going around her mind, she's feeling pretty awful. She's feeling very stressed. Her stress hormones are raised. So again, whole body effect, okay? Her pulse rate is probably higher than it was before. So this is affecting her whole body. Now let's move to the dog. What's the dog thinking? The dog is thinking, oh, this is a nice walk. What can I see in front of me? So the dog is not thinking about whether it's a good dog or not. The dog is not worrying about the fact it's just made a mistake. And the dog is not worrying about the fact that it might not have a job tomorrow. Yeah, none of that, because it, dogs don't have the neocortex that we have. And so in one way, our neocortex is fantastic, right? It enables us to do this amazing stuff. But for our mental health, it can be problematic. Okay, so let me talk to you about the emotional systems in the brain. This is a little bit of neuroscience. I'm not going to go too deep. We haven't got a lot of time today. I'm very aware of the time. Um, but this is the three circles model. And it's a model that I use in just every aspect of my work. It's really easy to understand and people can really apply it to their own well-being um, in the moment. We've got two positive emotional systems at the top, okay? So they're the drive system in the blue circle and the soothing system, which is the green circle. And when I say positive, I mean, it's good to be in these systems. It feels good. We enjoy being in these systems. Let me tell you a little bit more about them. The drive system is our motivational system, okay? This is what makes us work hard towards the goals we want to achieve. So it's all about wanting, pursuing, achieving, progressing. And when we achieve that goal, it feels great. It feels amazing. So this is the kind of feeling if you pass an exam or you, you have an interview and you get the job or you get a promotion, um, it feels amazing, okay? It's exciting, it's wonderful. That is your drive system, and that's the dopamine. That's like a reward hormone. The only problem about the drive system is how long does that feeling last? And when I ask this, most people will say to me, oh, a few hours, like maybe a day if it's something really, really momentous, but no longer than that. And then how we're feeling comes back down again. So if we rest our entire well-being just on the drive system, it's going to be difficult. And this is what happens um, if you're a bit of a workaholic. <laughs> what you can find is that you find yourself working harder and harder to get that buzz, to get that buzz of achievement. But it's never going to last. And I just want you to to note that it's not long lasting. It's great and we all need it and we all need meaning and purpose, but it doesn't last. Let me move across to the green system, which is the soothing system. And this is all about our relationships. And it feels lovely to be in this system, but it's very different to the drive system. In the soothing system, we feel contented, we feel cared for, protected, um, Often we feel very calm. We also feel warm. I look out for people describing it as warm when they're talking about their green system. Um, and 
it's sort of this is where we have peace of mind. And this system is a lot more sustainable for well-being than the drive system. OK, so we need both of these for high levels of well-being. It's important that we have safe, supportive relationships around us. And that's both at home and at work. And then moving down to the threat system. OK, this is the negative system. We do not like to be in threat. It feels unpleasant. It's our survival system. Yeah, this is what helps to keep us safe. And so this is where anxiety comes from. Sometimes this is where anger comes from. Also disgust sits in the threat system too. So it's all about keeping us safe. And the hormones are adrenaline and cortisol. They're the stressy hormones. Problem with the threat system is it's evolved to be quite sensitive because it made sense to run away from what might have been a lion 10 times, even though it was actually only a lion once. So it's quite a sensitive system. Um, now, I've said, which is your largest circle? So if you haven't already, could you type up in the chat box, which is your largest circle at the moment? The drive system, the blue one, the soothing system, the green or the thread, threat system, um, the red. So I'm going to just stop sharing again so I can see my chat box. Trying to get the chat up, I'm not succeeding. Where's it gone? Let me just stop sharing for a moment. Drive. Ah, <laughs> there's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Drive, drive, drive. Green, fantastic. Somebody's got the soothing system up there. Drive, drive. Um, green, definitely the drive system. Yeah. OK, so this is not surprising to me because I'm speaking to educational leaders. <laughs> this is not at all surprising. OK, excellent. Um, OK, let me go back to um, sharing my screen again. So we've got lots of very highly um, driven people in the room today. Good, good, good. Excellent. Exactly the sort of people that I like to talk to. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, um, for emotional health, the aim is to get the circles roughly the same size. We need all of them. We need all of them. We need our threat system. We need to stay safe. We need the soothing system. We need the drive system. But ideally, to get balance, we want them the same size. OK, we're coming up to our breakout room. Um, so in your breakout rooms, we're going to put you into breakout rooms of four. Um, we'd, I'd like you to discuss with the other people what situations you find most difficult in your work role, what emotions are triggered in these situations, and then how these emotions affect you. OK, so what situations do you find challenging? Which emotions are triggered and how do these emotions affect you? So if we could put people into breakout rooms now. What I want to know, I'm really interested in this, which is the most difficult emotion you experience at work? And so A is anxiety, worry or panic. B is frustration, anger, kind of irritation. And C is sadness, hopelessness or demotivation. So could we do the next poll, please? Thank you, Catherine. OK, so I will share this in, in a moment. I'm just watching everybody log on. It's looking like we have frustration, frustration in the lead, closely followed by anxiety and then a little bit of sadness from from some people, too. OK, thank you. So let me just share those results for you on the screen. So 34 percent of you, anxiety, worry or panic is the most difficult emotion. 56% frustration, anger, or irritation. Really interesting. Um, and then 10% of you experiencing sadness. Okay. Um, let me explain to you what's happening very, very quickly before we move on to our meditation. I'm just going to talk about the frustration because that's what most of you are experiencing. Frustration is about when we're trying to get somewhere with our drive system and something's blocking it. 
And so actually what's really interesting is I was talking to somebody, I was talking to somebody in, in our room um, and she said the most difficult thing was actually sort of working with colleagues and trying to find a way forward and agreeing. And so therefore that links straight to the frustration you might feel as a leader um, when it's difficult to do that because other people are kind of blocking your drive system. And that can make us incredibly like frustrated, angry, irritated. And that's okay because that's what makes you human. But I'm gonna to end today with an exercise to help you manage that frustration, okay? Often with emotions, we're not very good at accepting that we're human and we have emotions. And we frequently resist them. We either kind of deny that we're experiencing them or we try and avoid them or we criticize ourselves for the fact we're feeling that. So if you're getting angry as a leader, you might then think, oh, I'm not a very good leader. I'm just so annoyed with my staff. Uh, you know, I'm just such a rubbish leader, aren't I? I shouldn't be getting annoyed with them. It's okay to get annoyed. It's okay to get frustrated. Um, and actually what I want to teach you to do today is to accept that frustration and to welcome it. And actually when we welcome emotions, they tone down. It's almost like by listening to them and welcoming them, we just reduce their effect slightly and then we can be wise then we can choose how we want to respond rather than letting the emotion kind of take control. And I just want you to do this now. I know some of you in like busy offices and stuff, you can do this exercise with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. We're just gonna spend five minutes, got five minutes left. It's a sort of mindfulness meditation and it's called Welcome to the Party. So let's go straight into it now. Just sitting on your chair. If you can, put your feet flat on the ground and have your shoulder area, your chest area and your shoulders nice and soft and open. And if it's safe to do so and you feel comfortable to do so, please do close your eyes. And I want you to bring to mind a situation recently where you felt really frustrated or irritated or angry at work and just spend a little while remembering that situation remembering when it was what was happening picturing it in your mind who was with you what were you trying to achieve and what made it difficult And then I want you to scan down from the top of your head, down through your body and become aware of where you feel the anger and the frustration in your body. Every emotion has a physical signature in the body. As I said, emotions are not just in the mind, they're whole body experiences. So see whether you can scan down, starting at the top of your head, coming down to your forehead, down into your cheeks, your face, your jaw area. Now, often if we're feeling frustrated or angry, we get a clenching of the jaw, a tightness in that area. Just noticing whether it's like that for you. Then moving down into your neck and your shoulders. And again, sometimes if we're irritated and frustrated, our shoulders rise up towards our ears. Okay, so just noticing if you're holding attention in your shoulders, remembering the situation. And then moving down to your chest area, down to your arms as well, and your hands. And again, noticing with the when you're feeling frustrated, you feel a sort of um, clenching in your hands, a tightness in your hands. And then moving further down into your legs, upper legs, through your knees, into your lower legs and your feet. And then I'd like you to focus on the place where you feel this frustration the most. 
And that might be in your jaw, might be your neck, your shoulders, maybe it's in your abdomen. People have different physical signatures and that's okay. So noticing that and in your mind, labeling that sensation, frustration, irritation, anger. And then I want you to breathe into that part of your body using your breath to help support yourself. So breathing in through the nose, down to that part of your body. And then breathing out. And as you breathe out, just letting that part of your body soften a little. Taking another breath, breathing into that part of the body. And then breathing out and letting that part of the body soften as much as it wants to without trying to force it. And then I want you to say in your mind, welcome frustration, welcome irritation, welcome anger. Welcome to the party of my life. Because everything is welcome today. And it's even better if you can allow yourself a little smile as you do this. Okay, so a little smile about what it's like to be human, about how difficult it is about our tricky brains, about all the experiences that have shaped and molded us and about how we can't help the way we feel. This irritation, this frustration you're feeling, that makes you human. So open to it, welcome it, and then just notice how that makes your body feel. And see if there's any change as you open and welcome the emotion. And then we're going to finish the exercise by focusing on our feet and the contact that our feet are making with the ground. Noticing how solid and firm the ground is under our feet. And when you're ready, opening your eyes, having a look around and just coming back into the session. Okay, well done. So that's welcome to the party. And if you regularly practice welcoming and accepting those emotions rather than trying to resist them or push them away, remember what you resist, it persists. That's a phrase we have in therapy. Whatever we resist, it persists. If you can learn to welcome them, it can really be quite transformational. Okay, we have come to the end of the workshop. Thank you so much for taking part. Um, I wish you well. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And remember, put your own well-being first because you guys do an incredible job and you hold everybody in your hands and you're amazing. So look after yourselves, prioritize yourselves, allow yourself to be human and welcome those emotions. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Kate, for a very thoughtful and thought provoking session. And I must say, I um, I did smile when I was welcoming irritation. <laughs> <laughs> I almost found it difficult to come back. I was so relaxed, um, but that was great. And thank you very much for everybody who's joined us today. Um, and we hope you'll be able to join, come along to the next session about effective, uh, being an effective leader, which starts in about 13 minutes time. Um, I just wanted, ah, this oh, is. Oh, yes. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, Kate, Kate hasn't seen this cover, just hot off the press. So I just wanted to share the cover of a book that Kate is co-authoring. Um, and it's for educational leaders, cultivating teacher well, well-being. So it's kind of about obviously your own well-being, but cultivating well-being in your institution as well. And it's actually working in progress um, and it will be published next spring. But I just wanted to share the cover with you now. Um, and, and I can say, having seen the manuscript, it, it's going to be a great book. It is a great book. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks very much, everyone, and hope to see you in some later sessions. Thank you.